um, you are very, very, very welcome. God bless you. It's lovely to see you. It's lovely to have you uh, uh, as part of our, our service today. May you be uh, encouraged in the name of the Lord. May you meet with him, whether you are at home or here at church. May God, um, really, may you have an encounter with our Lord in a very special way. Um, let me read from uh, the book of Joshua as we start our service. This is when uh, the people of Israel crossed the Jordan. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to fa face the Israelites. Further along in the chapter, it says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or our enemies? And he said, Neither, he replied. But as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So Lord, we come before you, a holy, holy God. And we want in humility to surrender all of ourselves every aspect of our lives and to give you the praise because you are the one that is victorious and in you we are more than victorious. Let's stand and worship God um, with flags, with, uh, with all of our hearts um, and worship him that is worthy of everything.
Lord, we love you. We want to express all our adoration, all our worship, all our thanks, all our praise, Lord, because you are a good, good God, Lord. Lord, you sustain us, you keep us, Lord. You brought us, Lord, into new life. Lord, we, we want to th thank you, Lord, for everything you do, Lord. And Lord, we recognize that sometimes, Lord, we go our own way, Lord. We say we love you, but we go our own way. We do what pleases us only, Lord, and goes against what your word tells us, Lord. And when that happens, Lord, when we act in stubborn heart, with stubborn hearts, Lord, when we, are, when we act, Lord, in selfish ways, when we act, Lord, in ways that do not honor you or honor those that are created in your name, Lord. Lord Jesus, we just ask you that you would forgive us for what we've, how we've offended you in our words or deeds or thoughts, Lord. Lord, because we do not want anything to come between you and us, Lord. Lord, we want to be in a correct standing with you. And Lord, we thank you for your great mercy and grace shown to us by your life-giving life -giving act on the cross, Lord. And so, Lord, we thank you that when we bring every sin to you, Lord, we know we can and are forgiven. Not because of what, who we are but what, how, or who you are Lord and what you have done so Lord we give you thanks now and, 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 and really um, rejoice at the fact Lord that as your people we have been forgiven by your grace Amen Amen just take some time to um, uh, meditate in this song and it's a song that how God takes us all as broken vessels and makes us anew so just, just as you're standing if you want to stand up and wave flags or other things as well that's fine but just take time to, to think through this, this worship song
yourself down Raising up the broken to Yourself down, raising up the broken to life. And that's what our heart is here at All Saints. We want everyone to know the one that can heal broken hearts and the only one the only way to to know that total and absolute healing is to come humbly before him and say lord not my way but yours so i i'm going to ask everyone today that's here you know people that are hurting you know people that are going through difficulties. It might be something you've heard on the news, or it might be someone in your neighborhood or your family. This is a moment that as church, we come to intercede. We come to pray for, to bring before the Father. Remember that story of the friends of Jesus, friends of this paralytic man, bring him to Jesus. And how they presented him before Christ to, for, for his healing. In a sense, that's what we're doing in intercession. We, we're bringing people and saying, God, please bring healing in this, in this situation. So I'll just, we'll have a time of quiet. And you, in your own words, bring it to God. Bring that person, that situation to him. Lord, in your words we read that you didn't come to condemn but to save. So Lord, you've heard our prayer. You've heard our cry for everyone, Lord, that we presented before you this morning. And we say, Lord, in your mercy, meet the people that we presented to you. Meet the situation that we've presented before you, Lord. And Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you would touch your church, your body, and you would empower us in the way that uh, 
would enable us, Lord, to do the work you called us to and to be all that you would have us be, Lord. To be light and salt in this world, Lord. Bless all that you've put in authority, Lord, and give them the wisdom they require. And Lord, we know that real wisdom comes from knowing you, Lord. So we ask, Lord, for our leaders, Lord, that they would come and know you, Lord. Amen. Amen. There's one only cornerstone, and that's Christ.
is Lord? Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Above all. Okay, please sit down as we come to our Sunday reading. I'll ask uh, uh, Sue and then Phil uh, Mortimer, please, to come and do the reading. Thank you so much. Good morning. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 23. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say that John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely humans. This is the word of the Lord. second reading is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. The armour of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. This is the word of the Lord. Right. Well, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. It's been quite a tough few weeks for quite a few of us at All Saints. Relationships are beautiful things, And being a church family is wonderful. But if relationships are real, it means that sometimes they get complicated. Even more so when we only get to see each other on Zoom, and some of you not even that. And we can't have those face-to-face encounters where relationships are restored. So what does it mean to be church? Well, we've been looking at that in our series in Ephesians, and that's now coming to an end next week. But let's have a look at what we've seen so far. Well, in chapter 1, we heard that God chose us. God chose us before the foundation of the world. He loves us. He gives us gifts. He makes us holy. And he makes us part of the church, his body, the family of those who belong to Jesus. For Paul, to be a Christian is to be a functioning part of that body, 
for the praise of his glory. And he's made us alive in Christ. That means that we don't live for ourselves anymore, but by his grace we have a new life focused towards God and his plan for us. It means that differences have been wiped out. God has brought outsiders in by taking away the dividing barrier of the law. And as this happens, God's great plan is made clear, not only on earth, but in the heavenly places. We, as church, have been made one. We are all God's gift to each other, to be community, to love each other, to work together and to share our lives. It may not be easy all the time. It will take commitment and effort, but it is totally and always a source of blessing. The church is God's idea, and like all God's ideas, it is a good idea. That's what God's done. Then in chapter 4, Paul turns to the implications for us. We are called to live a life worthy of our calling. We bear with one another in love. We make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Our unity is important. It doesn't mean that we're all the same or that we all do the same because God's given us different callings and different gifts. Gifts which build up the church so that we grow to maturity rather than being blown off course every time someone comes up with some novel new thing. Note that we have to make every effort to build up that unity. It's not the sort of easy companionship that comes naturally. That's good. But there comes a time when it's going to fail. And then we need to not just let it go, but make every effort to preserve the unity that God gives. We need to speak the truth. We need to speak the truth in love. And that's the challenge, isn't it? This unity, which is so vital, is not achieved by us all being the same. Neither is it achieved by covering up things which might potentially divide us. These things need to be brought to light. We speak the truth in love. Not just speak the truth and blow the consequences. Not just keeping silent and staying away from unpleasant truths out of love, but speaking the truth in love. And this is what Paul does in chapters 4 and 5. He insists very plainly that some behaviors are just unacceptable to Christians. And he insists that as followers of Jesus, we need to give up what he calls Futile thinking. There's no sugarcoating in his words. Futile thinking. And we see that this way of life that we're called to is very demanding. It includes both the way we treat each other and also things which in today's individual society are regarded as individual, our own private morality. Every aspect of our behavior is affected by the gospel. But that's tricky, isn't it? Paul has said in chapter 2 that Jesus has set aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Now the law, as we've seen, is what divided Jews from Gentiles. That was, in a way, the point of the law because it was there to define what God's people looked like. God told people how to live in a way that set them apart. Circumcision, for example. Not eating particular foods or wearing certain types of clothes or maintaining various rituals. 
These things were, were not the way to be saved, but they were signs, signs that they belonged to God's people. And we know that Paul himself no longer followed these signs. In fact, in Galatians, he spoke out very strongly against those who were trying to reinstate circumcision as a sign of belonging to God's family. But there's a difference. There's a difference between upholding the law which defines belonging and living by God's standards of holiness, which are set out throughout the Bible. And Paul is very clear that a standards and ways of behavior that we are expected to follow as God's holy people. And they're not negotiable. They involve, they involve truth. They involve honest living, helpful speaking, holy attitudes, sexual purity, self-control. Let no one deceive you with empty words, he says. Deceiving with empty words is the opposite of speaking the truth in love. And from the beginning of scripture to the end, God's spokesmen, the prophets, speak out in God's word against those who tolerate sin in the church. Sorry, I've missed out a couple there. That's right. Jeremiah said this, Prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. You know, you can't heal a wound by pretending it doesn't exist. And in the final book of the Bible, in Revelation, which is also, of course, a book of prophecy in the sense of speaking out God's word to the church, there are seven letters to seven churches. And we see from these letters that certain things are expected of the church. In one of those letters, Jesus says this, I know your deeds, your love and your faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you're doing more now than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself her prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. So there's a problem here in the church, and the problem isn't just that individuals are making wrong choices, but that the church, by saying nothing, is undermining God's message. The problem of sin in a church is not just an individual one. It's not possible for those, to those to whom God has given spiritual authority to remain silent on issues of lifestyle. Because while tolerance is in one way a good thing, tolerance of what is unacceptable leads to disaster. Right from the beginning of the Bible story, from the start of humanity, the basic issue has been this. Who gets to decide what is right and what is wrong? Is it God or is it us? Did God really say serpent deceived Adam and Eve, leading them to doubt God's word, and then questioning what God had said. You won't die. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Take the fruit, the servant says. Make decisions for yourself instead of going, to what, going with what God says. Of course, they didn't physically die there and then. But through their actions, sin came into the world, and therefore death. They'd taken their God-given authority and used it to serve the powers of evil instead of following God's way. So we have to decide, who is Lord? Will I go the way God says? Or will I choose for myself what is right? 
course, part of the issue is for the sake of the individual concerned. What loving parent would see their child embark on a course of self-destruction, truant or drugs or whatever? But there's also the effect on the whole body. To the church in Galatia, Paul says, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And I think this is something that we've seen stressed very much throughout this time of pandemic, haven't we? Our behavior affects others. Stay at home, we were told. Not just so that you'll stay well, but to protect lives and protect the NHS. Paul reminds the church in chapter 4 of Ephesians that we are a body, and what one part does affects every part. We can't just act as individuals if we're part of a church. But what does that mean? I mean, who is acceptable then to be part of the church? Is it, is it just a club for the holier than thou? Well, of course not. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's ways for us, and we do it time and time again. We all know that, don't we? We come to God not because we're good enough, but because in him we find healing. In him we find wholeness and goodness and unconditional love. Yes, unconditional love. God loves each one of us no matter what. And in that love, he calls us to come to him and to live his way because that is the best plan for us. He knows that we've failed. He helps us to pick ourselves up. But if we choose to continue in sin, if we turn our backs on him and say, no, my way is better, then the relationship remains broken. There is always forgiveness when we look for it. In fact, God longs to forgive us. That's how much he loves each one of us. Not only those already in church, but every person there is. Like the shepherd in the parable, he'll leave the 99 and go and look for the one. Like the father of the prodigal, and waits for us to turn around and come back to him. But we have to return. We have to want to mend the relationship even when it means dying to ourselves and choosing to go his way. What is at stake is that if we harden our hearts if we don't come back to him, it gets harder all the time. So, coming on to the verses read today, Paul says to us, be strong. Is it surprising with everything that we're called to be and do as a church that we need to be strong? But the strength that Paul has in mind looks very different to how strength looks from the outside. Be strong in the Lord, Paul says. God isn't looking for strong people to join his team. He's looking for people who know, who know that they need him to give them strength. In Corinthians, Paul says this, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. The strength that he gives in worldly terms may not look very impressive. Think of those words um, that Sue read to us this morning that Jesus spoke to Peter and then to the other disciples. 
Simon Peter has recognized that Jesus is Messiah. He's the one sent by God to save them. And so Jesus calls him strong. He calls him Peter, the rock, and says that on this rock he can build. Because Peter is standing strong against unbelief, he's standing strong against popular opinion to declare who Jesus is. He's speaking out God's word, the thing that God had revealed to him. But it's Jesus who does the building. Do you remember what he said earlier? Everyone, sorry, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts of them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The church needs to be built on the rock of God's word. And why? Because of what Paul says here in Ephesians. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. But it's against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. People are not our enemies. We're told to love our, our neighbors, to love those who do us wrong, to pray for those who persecute us. Our battle is in the spiritual realms. Straight after his declaration, Peter tries to show human strength by offering to protect Jesus from death. But Jesus sees through his kind but mistaken offer, which is a response to the from the enemy to distract him from his mission. And his response is firm. It's startling. Get behind me, Satan. No. We stay strong when we stay in the will of God, standing on his word. And sometimes it will look very much like weakness, just as it did when Jesus was arrested and crucified. Sometimes it will lead us where we don't want to go. But our strength isn't merely defensive. On this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, do you know something? Gates are not known for leaping out and attacking people. We're not called to defend ourselves merely against the gates of hell. Our brief as church is to attack those gates. And they will not stand. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the powers in this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. And it's on behalf of a world under attack. The thief, Jesus said, comes to steal and kill and destroy. He comes to spoil people's lives and keep them from entering the kingdom of God. And our brief is to say, no, you don't. You are a defeated enemy. The victory was won by Jesus and we won't let you fool us any longer. We will fight for our family, for our friends, for our town, for our country. And the gates of hell will not prevail because the battle belongs to the Lord. We fight as we stand together. An army doesn't fight with each soldier doing what they think they'd like to. We fight with a common purpose, acting as one. The Roman army would use their shields to stand together, protected not only by, by their own shield, but by their formation, which was known as a tortoise, that they make together. And they didn't just stand there like that. In this formation, they could advance forward, advance on the enemy. So let's be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Let's stand firm together to do the task that God has called us to, to be his church here in this place. Next week we're going to wrap up our look 
at Ephesians with, with a look at the resources that God gives us that he makes available to us to help us to be the church he's calling us to be. Amen. Um, let's answer, let's just reply to that uh, sermon in the words um, that uh, come in this uh, worship song. Oh, come to the altar. Just to remind you also that uh, as from uh, Monday, we continue with our reflection, our Lent reflection at 7.30. And all the other 
uh, groups like um, uh, Wednesday gathering and Friday um, are as, as normal. Uh, may God bless you as you take part in the different activities of the church and also remember also that, that um, you are God's holy people wherever he has placed you. You are light and salt and, and he is with you um, and he will uh, use you mightily as you step out in faith. I mean, I don't think there's anything else that we need to say at this moment. Nope, that's great. Okay, God bless you. And uh, I, oh, one thing I was really important thing that I was forgetting. Um, Trish was birthday was yesterday, and Mark was the day before. No, Thursday. Well, um, happy birthday. Oh, and Phil. Yes. Oh, Phil. Yes. God bless you all. May you know his grace in this new year for you. Amen. Um, let's uh, end up our time with the song Build Your Kingdom Here. And can I encourage you also to, to be generous with... Uh, um, with your gifting, there's a there's a uh, bowl. No, there's a, a um, container at the back <laughs> uh, for offering. So please be generous and 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 give uh, um, as the God, uh, God as God guides you. Amen.
blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you as he's promised. And go and be light and salt where God has placed you. May you be blessed in obeying and submitting to his will. May you see his hand at work in your life. And may God be glorified through it. Amen. Blessed be.